Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Triangle BNI. My name is Mike Manning, and each week we bring you a small business success story from BNI. If you are not familiar with BNI, it is Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in central part of North Carolina, if you are not from here, is called the Triangle. That's Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. Have 29 chapters going strong each week, six core groups trying to get to that point to be a full chapter, and almost 600 members uh, related to small business, either own or work in one, uh, that show up each week to help their fellow members grow their business. And if you've never been to a BNI meeting before, if you'll go to trianglebni.com, in the upper right hand corner, there's a button that says find a chapter. If you click on that, uh, you can punch in the day of the week you want to meet, the time of the day you want to meet to find out what's good for you. And we recommend you please go visit. You'll meet some wonderful people. And each week we bring you wonderful people like that. And our guest this week is Joe Woolworth, owner of Relevant Media Solutions. Joe, good to have you here today. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. A couple of things you know about Joe mm-hmm. that we'll get to. One is he has a black belt in media, which I like that. We'll get to that. And he's a fellow podcaster. First one on the show that's a fellow podcaster. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We like firsts on the show. Yeah. Um, so you're a fellow podcaster. Joe is in RDO2. They, it's called Carry Connections. They meet Monday mornings at 830 at the Maiden Inn. And you just came from your meeting and you said yes. it went well. Yeah, we had our visitor's day. All right. How so, many, about how many people showed up? I'd say we probably had 10 visitors. All right. A couple of potential new members? I hope so. All right. What, uh, what kind of seats is your chapter looking for to fill while you're talking to everybody about uh, Well, we got, we, got a, we got a good amount of seats. We're looking for people in the trades. Um, okay. We're looking for an attorney. Um, we're looking for family photography. Yeah, that's um, a big one. We're looking for um, commercial real estate. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And your meeting is a good time for trades because they can come to the 830 meeting, be gone by about 10 and have the rest of the, the day to do stuff. Yeah. Because I know in B&I, the groups that meet at lunch struggle getting trades because it's tough to tell yeah. your client, hey, I'll be back in two hours and finish the job. They probably don't go that way. But the morning right. meetings for trades are real good. So yeah. we wish you luck on that. Uh, first question I always ask people is we're actually, golly, we're latter part of May right now. So how's 2019 business been for you and yeah. for relevant media solutions? So it's kind of like an inaugural thing for me. I was doing my, I was, uh, yeah. I was doing my business as a side hustle for many years. Like a lot of people do as freelancers. And, um, I think since 2007 ish, I was mm-hmm. running relevant media solutions. And, uh, for the last about eight years, nine years, I'd been on staff at a large church in the area, and I've been doing that. But we'll talk about that. January yep. was the time that I decided to pull the ripcord and go out and do the business thing full time. And one of the things I, <laughs> I love about being I, and I tell people each week, I'm a big proponent of that. My brother and I started two businesses uh, strictly through being I. Is we all come from different backgrounds, yeah. age wise, part of the country, how we got started in that. What all went into that decision to make 2019? to leave the church, to start a relevant media, go on your own and just show that you're all in for this? Yeah, a good question. I think there was a lot of things going on in my life, like a swirl of decision-making <laughs> factors. Uh, I lost my dad that year. It was a tough year for the family. Uh, cancer yep, uh, passed me too. away. Yep. And um, the work stress was, I mean, I wouldn't say that it was more than it had been in the past, but um, I was responsible for a lot. Hope is a great church. And, um, but I was happen to be responsible primarily for stuff that happened on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And my kids are getting to the age now where they're getting ready to do the weekend sports things and be involved in stuff. And, uh, my job wasn't going to change. Right. It was, uh, it was the weekend related. We have services, uh, all throughout the weekend at Hope Community Church. Um, and so I decided, you know, now's the time. Never going to get a redo on high school years. My oldest is going into high school. Uh, And, um, so decided it was time to, to finally make the jump. As well as my wife has a really good, solid job. Oh, and, good. Uh, gave us but that, that's a factor. To, oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I always uh, joke that very few people on their deathbed <laughs> say, I should have worked more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, give me your best dad story. Because I lost my dad, same thing to cancer a couple of years ago. But give yeah. me your best dad story. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, we were going, I grew up in, in pretty rural Michigan. And so the, the big thing to do on the weekend for us was fish. Okay. And uh, so dad and I were going fishing and... Uh, we were riding down to the reservoir. We had a reservoir by our house. And so we decided to ride bikes, which was weird that my dad wanted to ride bikes with me. I think he would have been, you know, 40s that time that uh, he decided to ride bikes. And there's this big hill called uh, <laughs> Dead Man's Hill. 
that we were riding down on the way there. And, you know, you pick up speed or whatever. And my dad's bike had this wobbly wheel in the front. And for whatever reason, um, he decided that the right time to adjust this wobbly wheel thing was going fast. <laughs> and so he decided to just kind of take one foot off the pedal and kick that front wheel and get oh, it going no. in time. And he's carrying his tackle box and I got the poles and he goes up over the, <laughs> over the, <laughs> over the, the handlebars and bounces like twice on his butt. And uh, there's that moment, you know, like, have you ever seen like with your parents? You're like, can I laugh at this? Yeah. Oh, Is this yeah. okay? Oh yeah. There was this moment. And he just started laughing and Good. I started laughing and it was, uh, we got back on the bikes and went fishing, but, uh, cause he knew at that very moment when the, when his foot touched the wheel, <laughs> that this was a bad idea. Yeah, right? He probably knew like <laughs> on the way to the wheel. Yeah. That's funny. Was he born and raised in Michigan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He grew up in, in pretty much right. the same area that we were in. His family's still there. All right. Woolworths, not the, not the Woolworths with the five. And well, nine. I was going to ask that. Yeah. So I was going to congratulate you on inheriting all that, yeah. but we could move on. So, uh, did you do ice fishing as well? I never got into ice fishing. No. I mean, a lot of people there do yeah. ice fish, uh, but I never did. It was, uh, it's not, nothing we ever got into. It's always seemed a little strange to me to drive your car out on the lake. Yes. I'm with you on that. Yeah. And then build a fire yeah. on the ice and then, but to first, keep your dead you know, warm. First drill a hole in it yeah, right. <laughs> before you start a fire. Yeah. It's got all the elements of a disaster, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. And I've seen those in movies and TV shows. I'm the same oh, yeah. thing as you. Like, no. It's always like once or twice a year, you know, cousin Jeff lost a snowmobile. Like, <laughs> lost in the bottom of the lake. We'll get it in the summer. Oh, love that. <laughs> uh, if you have never been to a, a B&I meeting, each week there's a featured speaker. And depending on the size of your chapter, it's usually five minutes or 10 minutes. <laughs> and that's their chance to stand up and talk more about themselves and their company. And it's a, one of the, the benefits of being a B&I. We always introduce the guests with the member bio sheet. So, Joe, this is how we do it here. So this is how we're going to do it today. All right. Joe, I updated this. Uh, I, I'll ask you if you haven't. <laughs> so uh, I know what you wrote down last time. We'll see if it matches and we'll go from there. Joe Woolworth, owner of Relevant Media Solutions. You've owned it. You started it in 2007. Yes. But you're officially just relevant media since January, 2019. Correct. Okay. Up right. until then it was side hustle. Right. Which we'll talk about that, which are kind of good things. Uh, years in business. So we'll call that 12. Mm -hmm. And it's a, you build and promote websites for people. And we're going to get into more about that. Why? But is that kind of the gist of it? It started as a building websites for people. Yeah. Primarily. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a friend? Do you remember the first website you built? First website I built, I probably would have been the first version of Relevant Media's website. Um, I think the first paid website that I built was most likely a some churches website. Okay. I built a lot of church websites. And in 2007, what was the computer you built that first website on? Oh, a Hewlett Packer, the the <laughs> one that had like the blue on it back when they were trying to look like the Macs forever back then. Yeah. When they sold that one year, they tried to make them look like the Mac Pros. <laughs> I'm not dying over here. He's like, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> Oh, admit that you, you use that one too. Uh, was did WordPress exist back then? Or uh, what'd you build it? What format did you build it on? No, when I first got started, I was building in Dreamweaver. So uh, oh this was back before there was a CMS, which is what WordPress is, or a content management okay. system where you could log into the back end. So back when I first started, bought my first Creative Suite pack when it was Creative Suite two. And so this was back when it was push and pull through FTP and you were, you were doing everything from scratch yourself. So okay. if you wanted a picture, you put it there and then you, <laughs> you wrote the code and there was not a lot of shortcuts back in the day. So it's a little different today is what I'm hearing. Oh, absolutely. From you. Okay. Yeah. A little easier. Yeah. And it's made, it's made for the rise of a lot of people that live in that niche, like yep. Wix and companies like that, that have found ways to make it easier for kind of consumers or people that don't want to hire a firm to do their website to yep. try and do it themselves. Previous types of jobs, I have those. I'm not interested in those yet, but yeah. I need a good high school story growing up in a small town in Michigan. Yeah, so high school job. growing up. So I had all kinds of fun jobs out there. I worked at a Christmas tree farm, which that's okay. fun. You get to ride a four-wheeler around. The family picks out their tree, and then you get to chop it down. And, oh, uh, really? Put okay. It in a little bag and all right. stick it on there. Stick it in their car. In the snow or the ice or the sleet. Oh, yeah, right? it's yeah. cold in Michigan okay. for sure. Uh, I worked as a sandwich artist at a Subway. Um, which an is artist, what, I yeah, like that. that's what they put on your name tag when you yeah. work at Subway, sandwich <laughs> artist. Uh, I don't know if it was very artistic, yeah. but I do remember it was when I first started dating my wife and, uh, it was a franchise and the guy who owned it never worked there. So often I worked alone. And so like, we often like made out in the freezer. Okay. Um, you know, my wife would come up and visit the, the Subway there. I like that. My soon 
Soon to be Soon to wife, be, yeah. yeah. Your girlfriend slash, yeah, at mm-hmm. the time. Oh. Yeah, yeah <laughs> literally. I like that. The first time you had to cut that sandwich, the, the foot long in half, uh-huh. did you give it a nice straight slice through the middle of it? To I don't remember, man. Okay. I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's hardly sandwich artistry. It's not tough to chop a piece of bread in half and, <laughs> and follow the formula that they have written there of the sneeze guard. Well, it's good food. <laughs> and I appreciated when they went to the day of salad. So if you don't want to eat all that yeah. bread, you can just have that foot long in a sandwich, in a salad. And I love that. Yeah. I'm big with that. So. Who now did a local guy own that? You said yeah. he was never there. Mm-hmm. Did you know him? Was, Is that kind of how he got the job? Uh, no, no, I just applied with everybody else. I think, um, I think he owned a couple of subways. Okay. Did you tell him because you could build websites, you were an artist and therefore it would apply to? I wasn't building websites back then. <laughs> I was in art class, maybe. Okay. Maybe that yeah. was it, right? That was a little top of your resume, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next part of the <laughs> bio sheet is family. And you and your wife, Lori. Yes. Uh, I always ask this question too. How did you two meet? And do you tell it the same way? I bet we do because I bet we would say something similar to like, I don't know. We knew each other from around. It's a small town yes. we grew up in. And uh, she was two grades ahead of me growing up. So there just wasn't that many kids. So I'm sure she knew I existed and I knew <laughs> she existed. But it wasn't really that we met and had a conversation until we ended up meeting in youth group. A, a okay. small church that was in town and um our first date i didn't know it was a date so i was <laughs> it was close to my 16th birthday i wore my little league jersey which happened to be green and yellow okay. rpm auto sales blue sweatpants some voight sneakers and uh we were hanging out with buddies is what i thought yeah. and we went to go see a movie and there's this place by where we grew up called frankenmuth it's like this tourist town and we were just goofing around what you do in frankenmuth is you sample the fudge if you're cheap like we were they had like a fudge <laughs> shop and I bought this Chinese yo-yo and I was like being annoying and hitting her with it and stuff. And we went to go see a movie and uh, I noticed like throughout the movie, we were really talking a lot more than I normally did with girls. And uh, I mean, obviously I, I was attracted to her I'm a teenage boy and she was gorgeous. Two years older than you. Yeah, too, two yes. years older than me. But I think that was the factor. Where I didn't even think it was a date. Yeah. Right. Um, but then afterwards, like my buddy was like, so how'd it go? Did you like the date? And I was like, wait, <laughs> hold on. I, I so wore then that. I, then I had to follow up and be like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm interested for sure. Uh, and then from that point on, I don't think we spent a day apart for like two years. Really? Yeah. We just really 16 and she was 18. Uh, okay. Maybe 17. All right. Well, I like a small town where you go from a youth group to making out in the freezer at Subway. Yeah. Just that's what normal. Yeah, they overlap. That's a normal day, right? That was all in the same story. <laughs> you were letting her get away, right? <laughs> I'm working by myself, sweetie. Come on up tonight, right? No, I, no. Uh, two kids, two girls, right? Yep. Right. Yep. How old? Katie and Maddie. So uh, 15. Well, she's she's about to be. 15. Oh man, you got driver's <sighs> license plans she's and insurance. Be 14 soon. That's what I think. Yeah, 14 soon. Sorry. So she's going into ninth grade, and then Maddie is going into seventh grade. So mm. Currently, it's third and twelve. Who are they more like? Which one favors you versus Lori? I think personality-wise, like Katie's more like my wife, and Maddie's more like me. Okay. All right. You guys on Saturday mornings kind of pair off that way sometimes, and around the house or occasionally. Okay. Yeah, occasionally. Oh, uh, you have two dogs. It says on here. I like the name of the second one, but tell us yeah. the names of the two dogs. Uh, Jazz and JPEG. JPEG. Do tell. How do we get to JPEG? And what do you call him for short? Peg? No, I just call her JPEG. Okay. Uh, it's a file extension. If you're yeah. a nerd, you've ever seen save something on your... <laughs> so, there's really not a lot of thought that went into it. I just thought it was funny. Okay. Did the, girl, did the girls get it when they got older? No. Where it came uh, from? Or is they still... I don't think so. <laughs> okay. The other dog is named after a Disney princess, Jasmine. Yeah. So, okay. Maddie got the name. So. Right, that'll work. <laughs> and those are good stories for kids, like naming their first dog and things like that. Yeah, we we had had other dogs before, and I finally got to pick this one, so I was pretty JPEG. specific about the kind of dog that I wanted and <laughs> okay. wanted to name it something. Hobbies and activities of interest. Yeah, so for me, I like I like woodworking. Mm-hmm. Woodworking is a passion of mine. Um, I like building stuff just in general. So I think that's cool. part of websites, yep. any kind of project thing i uh, i always tend to remodel the, whatever house we move into pretty much uh down to the studs nice. i like to think that i'm handy um or i don't let my non-handiness stop me from doing stuff you're handy enough i'm handy enough where you yes. don't have to call in somebody after oh, you've I done should. something no I but should. you haven't had to yet i haven't had to okay yet. well that's we'll go with that then uh city of residence 
So I'm in Cary. All right. How mm -hmm. long you been there? We've been there for, I think, nine years, 10 years. Right. Burn oh, by the way, what's Lori do? What are you doing? She's a director of operations at a community home trust in Chapel Hill, Carborough, and they do affordable housing. Oh, cool. Okay. Your burning desire is to? Uh, my burning desire is help people grow. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I wrote there. What did Very I write close. there? Help people tell a better story with their lives. <laughs> Yeah, I love Is that, that phrase. Yeah, yeah, I love the idea of telling a better story. And we'll get to that because that theme goes all throughout who you are mm -hmm. and, and what you do for the business. So we'll get to that. Uh, key to your success. You can't read. You got to remember. Uh, the key to my success. Yes. Uh, I, I probably put something because this, this is the truth. Um, I, have a, I have a good work ethic. I got it from you, my dad. That's half right. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and I really want to see people succeed. Okay. So I think that's, that's the comedy. You put the support of my wife and my work ethic. So, oh, yeah. That's yeah. definitely the first thing that Big I should have said. Okay. Uh, many people <laughs> watching don't know you well yet, which they will by the end of the show. Tell us <laughs> something no one knows about you. No one knows about me. I think I know what I wrote on the sheet. I spent a season in Mississippi teaching sex ed in like 13 <laughs> counties, which is normally a task that's relegated to uh, like grandmothers. Uh, yes. Who usually are the ones that write the grant and get the grant. Um, it was abstinence that we were teaching. Okay. How'd you get hired to do that? Were you a teacher in the schools? No. Nope, or did they just see this nice, gentle, trustworthy face with yeah. no facial at hair on it? At the time, I was working at it. I was helping out working at a church there, and it seemed like a good idea to me to get to meet some of the high schoolers that I was working in the youth ministry. Okay. So I'd get to go teach in health class. Okay. Uh, at, uh, I'd pick like a day like Thursday, and I'd go teach mm -hmm. every health class. And uh, it's fun. I got to get really good at those presentations. There you go. I have no idea why they hired me. Well, and dare I, the, my natural follow-up question is, did you learn anything teaching that class? But we'll move on probably. Yeah, so. no, I learned a lot <laughs> teaching that class. Uh, so we were in Mississippi. And so I probably taught thousands of kids, like my whole spiel, which is like a nine week thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so what would happen often that was not great is we'd be out around town and some teenage girl or teenage guy would be like, oh, hey, mom and dad, that's the sex guy from my school. <laughs> It was awkward every time. Yeah. Never got less yeah. awkward. Uh, my guy. wife was almost always with me. And there was, there would be like that moment of defensiveness. And I'd be like, that's not what they mean. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't, that's not what the class is. Uh, was this before or after Subway? Yeah, this was after. <laughs> this was after Subway. Uh, the other thing I learned, too, is if you do something for long enough, you realize, well, let me just say this. A lot of teenage girls who went through my class got pregnant. Oh, good. Is, okay. Well, then, yeah. All right. So not 100% effective rate as far as the <laughs> abstinence teaching goes. It's a great chapter in your book. So <laughs> I'm sure there's more to come on that. We are here with Joe Woolworth, owner of Relevant Media Solutions. Uh, first thing he started doing with the company was building websites. What do we as consumers, current small business owners, soon-to-be small business owners, think we know about what our web shop, website should look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... Um, I think the thing that most people think that they really know is what helps their product be easy to buy. And I think that's, that's the thing that most small business owners get wrong because yep. the things that might work in real life when you know somebody, it's usually trust and empathy that's helping you close the sale. Okay. And you probably say something along the lines of benefits and features, but they usually know you and they're doing business with you. Um, and I think that's one of the things that people seemingly get wrong the most when I visit a client's <laughs> website is that it's, uh, it's all about their features and benefits, almost like this is, this is why we're the hero and you should, you should do business with us. And the problem with that, although it's really good information, people want to know that you're good at what you're good at, they want to have trust and they want to have empathy in you as a business, is that you haven't done the thing that they went there for, which is yeah. tell them what problem you're solving, right. how you help them, so yeah. that they can be like, oh, this website's for me. And uh, I think that's, that's usually the first challenge that I notice with a small to medium-sized business that's decided to either go it on their own or another common problem that I hear is um, I've worked with this website guy. He helped me out and he <laughs> built exactly what I wanted. And I'm like, what the hell did I pay you for? <laughs> like, if I knew how to build a good website, I'd be selling websites. Um, and so I think the big missing component in where I really like to, to get involved is with the strategy side. Yeah. Like what is what is an effective strategy for helping whatever the business is identify the need that they're solving, format the data in a way that makes it memorable. And uh, yes. so if you go to my website, I say all the time, and I say it in my elevator pitch, that marketing is storytelling. 
And the reason I say that is because it's an exercise in memorization. There are paths that are carved in our brain that have been there for a long time. Um, I think we talked about this before. I don't know if you've ever saw the idea of what's called the desire path. If you're listening mm -hmm. at some point, just Google that. It's yep. like a fun thread on Reddit. But the idea is, is there are these, if you're a college campus and there's a grid of sidewalks all over, there'll be a, a, a path that's beaten down off to the side, which because people vote with yep. their feet. That's actually the way they want it to go. But you're over here putting the sidewalk over here or the staircase <laughs> over here because you think you know better. This is where they want to go. I see this over and over again on people's websites. People have a problem that they want to get solved. They know how they want to get there. And we're serving up information with elaborate staircases and things like yeah. we want to make them read all this information and we're not helping them uh, get to exactly where they're going quickly. Yeah. And so I believe that that's storytelling. I think that's the channel for this. one. It's almost <laughs> they want the they want it to look sexy and colors and yeah. all that stuff instead of being functional. Yeah. And it, like, and you and I talked last week a little bit about this. That's usually, I wouldn't say that's a death of a website, but the company, you've got plenty mm -hmm. of stories yeah. about how you've gone. No, no, let me give you a little it expertise. It should be pretty. Here. Like it can yeah. be both. It can be pretty and functional. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You should shoot for that. You shouldn't have to pick one or the other. Right. Um, but unfortunately, there are companies, like I mentioned Wix earlier, you can give them $25 and design a website. And their mission statement is we design beautiful websites. And they do that. And they're good at it. And if that's all you want is a beautiful website, you should absolutely use Wix. It's very affordable. But at the same time, that's not really what business owners want. They right. want a website that works for them. They want one that sells their product. They want one that sells their services. They want one that tells their story well. <clears throat> and I think the difference between just pretty and functional is strategy. Right. And, uh, and I think the strategy that makes the most sense for running your website through is this idea of story. And when you and I were talking last week, that was one of the things that jumped out at me because we're laughing there because you started talking real techie mm -hmm. and you lost me for a minute. And as soon as you <laughs> said storytelling, because yeah. that's what this show is about. People told us they love right. the stories. And you, they, you know, and I told you that I've met other website designers and their pitches will grow your business X number. Yeah. And I'll tell you how they just tell you they'll do that. But what stuck out with our conversation was the minute you said, I'm all about developing the storytelling to help the business yeah. tell the customer why they should do business with them. Yeah. So it's really, it's an exercise in using the principles that make storytelling effective and applying it to your business. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes people can hear like, I want to help tell your story. Like, like a great about page is all of a sudden going to make yeah. your, your business go way up. And I think people want to know you because they want to do business with people they know, mm -hmm. like, and trust. Um, but at the same time, I'll give you an example. Uh, I think I told you this example uh, from a client that I'm working with. He sells fences. Yes. And a uh, great guy, does a great job, fantastic at fences. And what I notice with most people when I do their website, they're really good at what they're good at. They've already done the hard work to become experts in their field, develop a process. And the idea of putting that online is a challenge. Like, I know what I'm good at. Yep. And so he was one of those guys that was, uh, you know, I really want somebody to help give me ideas on what to do better was kind of what was was going through his mind and so when i started relevant up in the january i spent some time focusing on all right how do i want to sell my services and i think when people buy a website they're not buying a product they're buying a process so mm -hmm. i spent a whole month just right now what my process is and then running a couple people through it doing interviews with clients and jerry was one of those guys mm -hmm. early on i said this is what mm -hmm. i believe i I can accomplish for you. This is what I want to do. And um, so the first step is just going through that strategy section, finding out the story component of it. So I go through this process that's based off of um, uh, Donald Miller's story brand, which is a great book. If you're interested more sure. and you're like, oh, let's talk more about story stuff or you want to learn more about that. That's a great book. Um, and so went through there, said, all right, who's the, who's the main character? What's that character's problem? And how do they meet that guide, that person in it? So if you think like movies, right? Every movie has a character who has a problem. Yeah. That's the beginning of the movie. It's only the first 11 pages in the script. If you don't set that up well, nobody's interested in your movie. <laughs> and then what, what a lot of small businesses, um, it might seem counterintuitive, but it's a powerful principle when you unlock it is they think that they're the hero in the story. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, the fence company is going to be the one that comes in and fixes it because he's really great at fences. Um, but like Zig Ziglar has that great quote about sales. And he says, people don't go to the store to buy a drill. They go to the store to buy the three-inch hole. 
The drill is the means to the end. Mm -hmm. They need the gotcha. hole. Um, and so with, with your services, it's fun to think about it in that terms for a service industry. And so Jerry already had the majority of his story told. He has this great story about being a cop, serve and protect. This is the <laughs> way he's wired. He's a giant man, like seven foot tall. Yeah. And he just really wants to protect and serve. And so when he got into making fences, it was about helping people protect their family and their investment. And um, so he was like 90% 90, 90 of the way there, already very successful. And so like applying this principle, then what if, because his logo is him kind of like this in front, of a, in front of a fence. And it says serving and protecting. Uh, protect your home, protect your investment, all good stuff. And what we did was identify that if we made this little tweak and said, what if Jerry's fencing company isn't the hero in the story? What if the customer is the hero? And the problem that they are coming to him to solve is they want to protect their loved ones, their yeah. pets. They want to protect their investment. And so we made a little bit of tweak. We changed the above the fold offer to we make buying fences fast and easy so you can protect your loved ones and your investment. And uh, we started taking pictures of satisfied customers in front of the fence yeah. and made them the hero in the story. And that little tweak right there, if you look at his traffic year over year, made the amount of people that clicked to get a custom quote from his website go up by 110%, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. I think a lot of times, especially in B&I, when we all, in a B&I meeting, we go around the room and we either have 30 seconds, 45 seconds, or 60 seconds to talk about our company. And a lot of times people, and when I do my training, I emphasize storytelling because they'll stand up and tell me what they do, right. but they don't tell me why right. or how. And the what, okay, yeah, you're, you build websites. Yeah. Excellent. Tell me the why. And that's why I love the storytelling part of it. I think a lot of people, like websites seem to be, when I'm doing my elevator pitch, one of those things that make people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> people in my industry uh, can be a, they can turn people off in a, in a couple of ways. We can come across like a little bit of used car salesman. And some of it's fear mongering. Like everything's a three letter acronym in the web world. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, your SEO stinks. And if you're not using SEM, then you're SOL. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of almost like you don't know what you don't know. So you got to give me all kinds of money. And so client education seems to be something that is um, a way that I am seemingly separating myself from the mm -hmm. field because I love to help people understand what it is and what it isn't. And um, I think so. We were talking about this very idea and I actually tried. I went to a networking meeting the night that you and I met last okay. time because we were talking and you were saying like when I talked the technical stuff. Oh man. I'm and then gone. when we talked yeah. talk about stories. So I went Love to a networking it. group and I decided I wasn't going to say websites or media companies the whole night. Like so when somebody's like, what do you do? I'm a storyteller. What does that mean? I said, well, I get to leverage the power of story to help your customers make your services and products easy. It's pretty cool stuff. And then I make them ask me questions. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I got three one-on-ones out of that meeting. And I never oh, said yeah. that I built websites. Yep. Which is pretty phenomenal. We, we are <clears> all, in the longer I do this, the training part of it, and also the speaking part, we, we all have stories that we, the best way for me to describe my brother to you is through a story. Yeah. I can tell you he's done this, then you're like, okay, I can give you a story. Yeah. And it's just, it is all, life is all about the stories. People love telling stories right. and other people love hearing a story told about them. Right. So I'm glad you had some success on that. Yeah. I'll, uh, my commission is a large sweet tea. We okay. talked about that earlier, <laughs> but it, but it's true though, because there's some industries that just turn people off. Cause when I go, Oh, I do pest control. If they don't have a problem, they're like, oh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, but the storytelling part of it, people can relate to that. So I'm yeah. glad you did that. All right. We are here with Joe Woolworth, owner of Relevant Media Solutions. Uh, been, has had the company going since 2007, went out on his own full time 2019. He's in RDO2, which is Carry Connections. They meet Monday mornings at 8 30 at the Maiden Inn. Please go visit. You'll meet some good people there. You are, again, we talked about first earlier in the show. Uh, I think making out in the subway freezer was a first as well. Yeah, I think my wife's going to be real stoked. Fellow podcaster, Laurie, how are you? Glad to have you on the show. Uh, Lisa right. through a story. Again, through a story. She's not going to watch this. That's all right. <laughs> oh, I'll find her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find her. So, uh, North Central University. Yeah. In Michigan. Minneapolis. Okay, in Minneapolis. But you are from, hang on a sec, Otisville, Michigan. Correct. Now, I Googled this over the weekend while I was mm -hmm. doing some research. The census in 2010 was 864 people. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Did you know most of them? I think growing up there, 
So I think people don't understand this about a small town. Like, so we were a county school, which means there's like a 17 mile gap between where everybody went to school together. And there just weren't that many kids, yeah. like 800. So absolutely, I knew every kid, which means I knew their parents. Mm -hmm. We were all on our bikes all the time. So like, I knew everybody down my road. Like I knew who lived in that house, what they did, which is just kind of par for the course for a small town. And um, yeah, but it was a small town. I had a farm, uh, cornfield behind me okay. and a cow pasture in front of me, my house. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yep, I got one sister. Okay. Older or younger? She's older. Okay, what's her name? Julie. Okay, were you known? Oh, that's Julie's brother. Um, or Julie's my older sister. I think probably. Okay. And is that how you knew some of your friends? You met them, oh, that's so-and-so's older. Yeah, so younger. she was two years, two grades ahead of me. Right. So, yeah, there was definitely, like, that's Julie's friend group. Yeah. And it's the people that are a couple years and older. And you were not allowed in there. Yeah. Yeah. Except Lori was... Two years older. Okay. So, did yeah. they know each other, Lori and Julie? Yeah. Probably did, right? Yeah, okay. yeah definitely. I'm sure right. they were in the same class. Right. So did Julie wave Lori off and go, he's, he's a dork. He's my little brother. I don't know. She tried. <laughs> she failed. I don't think she would have done that. <laughs> but yeah, big. I've got an older sister, two years older than me. And when the little brother tries to horn in on the bigger sister's group of friends who yeah. are generally all girls, yeah. it sometimes doesn't go well. <laughs> so get the yeah. wave off pretty quick on that stuff. So. But uh, and we hear stories. I did not grow up in a small town, but I love the stories on that. It's both good and bad that you know everybody. Yeah. Well, it's good in the sense for my parents. Like, I couldn't get away with stuff. Like, everybody was going to tell on you. Oh, like, yeah. there's no, like, yeah. like when somebody got teepeed, which is something that we do mm -hmm. when we're bored in a small town, which is throw toilet paper over their trees. Like, somebody's going to know. Or yeah. Somebody saw you, and they're going to tell your mom. Like, it's going to happen. Um, but, yeah. So, I mean... It's not great when you're a kid and trying to get away with stuff, yeah. uh, but I guess we weren't trying to get away with that much stuff. When I do my research for the show, I Google everybody, and sometimes stuff comes up where, eh, I'm probably not going to bring that up on the show. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's like, oh, that's kind of neat to know. On your Facebook page, you have listed, I forget under what category it is, skills or something like that. You're an office rerun expert. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is that? Oh, I've seen The Office all the way through. Oh, like the five show. Five or six times. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Well, you just lost me right there. I don't know so, if you've okay. ever, if you ever play that game, that trivia game, that app, that, uh, what's it called? It comes on every night. I can tell you the shit, the, the game I played to the show I played, but I'm years older than you. Yeah, go ahead. it's called, uh, I forget what it's called. It got really popular and then I forget about it all the time. It's a drinking game, right? No, it's not a drinking game. It's oh. an app game where you compete against other people for money. Okay. And I'm totally nah. blanking on the name no, that's right okay. now. When I was growing up, and Amnon might know this, there was Bob Newhart mm -hmm. had a show. And within the show, they would all, he would walk into the room, they'd say, hi, Bob, drink college drinking game. Hi, Bob. Yeah. And they probably said that 16, 18 times a show. Yeah. Hilarious. But okay, so Office the Show rerun. Okay. Yeah. And I thought was, of something cool, but anyways, I Anyways, I yeah. won that game. Oh, when, did you? When Office came out. I, I never watched the show. I, yeah, you like nah, it. I never watched the show. So It's fine. I was busy. Raising, you know, starting all this stuff. It's a huge monopoly I run. I, I don't have time to watch That's the big joke. I love that internet meme that you see all the time. It's like looking for something to watch on Netflix. Yeah, ah, yeah. screw it. Watch The Office again. Yeah. That's how I watch Netflix. Now, my <laughs> wife watched the uh, the British version of it early on. Yeah. And liked that, but we never got around to watching the American version. So, Now, you came from, you were the, had a couple of different roles at Hope Community Church yeah. right up here off of Buck Jones Road. Mm -hmm. You were there from 2010 till this past December, basically. Yep. The church was bigger than Otisville, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, your church was three times the size of the hometown you grew up in. Yeah. If definitely. you've never been, if you haven't been to Hope Community Church, it's a mm -hmm. massive, neat place. My B old B&I group met there. Wonderful people there. They welcome you, but it's big, man. Yeah, it's a big church. Yeah. So they might have about 10,000 on the weekend oh, yeah. across their campuses. And um, what's cool about Hope, well, I really liked working there. Uh, one of the things that drew me to work there, I've so I went to school to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been in and out of churches for forever on staff and whatnot. And um, when I went to visit churches in the area here, when we moved to the area, well, I started writing this blog about church shopping mm -hmm. on a blog that I had at the time that's yep. now been taken over by a Chinese company because I let it go. Uh, and so it's all like Is that an exported stuff. job? Should we yeah. get into that or not? No, so, it's okay. in Chinese. I don't know what okay. they're talking about. It's okay. not me anymore. But uh, Oh, that's probably why it was it. Okay, because I clicked on that site. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Other Chinese. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, that's probably a disconnect. But now, now it's funny. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I stopped writing for it for a long time ago. And then when I finally let it go, decided to let it go. Yeah. Somebody, what will happen is they'll buy your website if it still has traffic. 
And so they'll just oh, okay. they'll just put their traffic on there until your traffic dies off. So eventually, all the traffic that I was driving will die off, and they'll be done with me. And okay, they'll just let it go back to good debt or go daddy. But yeah, so I wrote this blog series about church shopping in the triangle, and it was interesting. One of the tech guys at Hope Community Church, his name is Mark Hanna, was reading the blog for some reason, and shot me a tweet and said, "Hey, you should come check out Hope. I'll give you the behind the scenes tour." So I was like, "Great, we'll check that out." I went and got to sit in the video booth and talk to Mark and their tech team and everything there. And um, just started going to Hope. Probably went there for about three months. And uh, my wife said uh, a job came up in the bulletin at the time. They were running a bulletin for a communications director. My wife said, you should apply for that. <laughs> so I do what I'm told. Hint, hint, yeah. <laughs> and, Good uh, executive decision. By yeah. So then started working there. A fantastic place to work. Yeah. Um, Good people. Mike Lee's a, he's an awesome founding pastor. and. Uh, was really kind of unique about that place to me is working in the church. There's something that that people in the church will call church face. Like yeah. you kind of pretend you're one way when you go to church, and then in reality you might be a completely different way. Okay. And uh, one of the things I really appreciated about Hope Community Church was there didn't seem to be like church face. Hmm. Uh, so in other words, people didn't feel the need to pretend that they were better than they were, kind of like we curate our life on social media. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was very attractive to me as somebody who had spent the last 10 years working in a church where in some of those churches, that was the case. And if if you're a church goer, like I was, like that was one of the goals to not do that, right? You yeah. want to be genuine with people and you don't want to kind of curate your life for your church friends either. And um, so I remember really being impressed by Mike the first couple of times I talked to him. Oh, like you're the same when you're off the platform as you are when you're on the platform. Good. And um, yeah. So. And that helped you kind of develop your business on the production side a little bit yeah. because I know you do a podcast, uh, Joe and, uh, Josh Manning do a podcast guys who guys who do things.com stuff. Guys, sorry. Guys who do stuff.com. Yeah. And you built Neither out. Neither one of those should you Google, by the way. Like you, you want to type directly in guys who do stuff.com. You own it, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And, but you built out a studio kind of similar to what we're yeah. in now. Mm -hmm. And part of that was, some of the things you learned working at Hope. Right? Oh, yeah, man. I got to learn a lot working at Hope. So it was a big team of very creative people. I'd say some of the most creative people in the triangle. And um, there was just a ton of stuff that we got to do. I got to I got to learn a lot about filmmaking when I was there. I actually spent some time, I think a couple of years, as a filmmaker on the team there, which kind of goes back to story mm -hmm. and just really defining what makes a fantastic story. And those those principles are universal. And when you can, you can stack them in the right order, uh, there's just a got me kind of binging my way through books about storytelling, screenwriting, and just kind of became a student of what good storytelling is. We know how busy churches get. We think 8.30 and 11 a.m. on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, but your weekends were jam-packed with sure, way yeah. more than those two services, right? Yeah, and we had a lot of resources pointing at the weekend. Um, in other words, we had spent a good amount of the time that week really focusing, this is what's going to go into this weekend service. So you didn't want to miss any of it. And you wanted to be early and you wanted to be prepared. And um, yeah, and I think there was really a culture of excellence at Hope Community Church that kind of, for people that are wired like creatives that want to do their best, it's a, it makes it a very attractive place to work. Because nobody's like, ah, whatever, it's just another weekend. It's definitely not the approach they take. It's like we worked really hard or the people that go here have worked really hard. I'll tell you, this principle translates to business too. Like when you get yourself into a room with a client, it's game time mm. and you want to be prepared and you want to put your best foot forward. And uh, Mike would often use the principle or the story of it's like when you have a guest over to your house, you're going to clean. You're gonna, your house is going to look nicer. Did um, that for the in-laws this weekend. You're going absolutely. to, you're going to use better China than the mm -hmm. paper plates you normally use. Yeah. You're going to step up yeah. your dinner game a little bit. Cut the grass, um, pressure wash the front that's door. Right, the whole thing. <laughs> you're going to do everything because you want them to have a good experience at your house yes. and you want them to come back. And I think that's that's a big component for churches as well. Yeah. Like you, you want them to have a good experience when they come and visit and you would like them to come back. And so there's a, one of the principles I learned about storytelling is there's a formula. And if you follow the formula, you increase your odds of success. And I think that there's a formula for an effective church service that I got to learn, like what, what makes it work in people's lives. And, um, and like I said, I, I just got to learn a lot. Yeah, Hope's a big church. I think people oh, think yeah. like, oh, you work at a church? That's cute. Oh, um, it's a small town. Yeah. yeah. I think the time that I left, we were about 250 employees. Yeah. And I was, um, yeah. yeah, it's a large business. Oh, yeah. And um, 
they are essentially, and people get uncomfortable with this, but I mean, you can use the phrase selling. Mm -hmm. And essentially what they're selling is a, is a solution to a problem, which is very common uh, that you see a lot in business. And my blog used to be called uh, Marketing Jesus. And that would really upset people because they didn't like the idea of marketing in the church world, which was fun for me because then people would leave these fun, hateful comments. They'd be like, <laughs> oh, you're missing the point. It's fine. It's okay. I think, uh, I think it's all right. <laughs> what did, so in that time, forming those thoughts about storytelling and knowing it's a, a small business, how does that apply now, now that you're in B&I yeah. as a business, small business owner? Well, I'll tell you, like, you talk about why, like my why. I was a little nervous leaving Hope because I got to work for this organization, one that I really believed in, and this cause that I really believed in. And I was a little nervous that by going into, like, the business sector, like, would I be able to get as motivated to help somebody do um, mm -hmm. something that probably didn't have, on my side, as much appeal, uh, appeal as the cause. Um, and what I learned quickly uh, was that it's not that different because when you boil it down to what I'm doing, I'm helping people tell a better story. I'm helping people grow. Yeah. And that was like the ultimate goal from working. Hope Community Church, their mission statement is to love people where they are and help them grow mm -hmm. in their relationship. Um, and so I get to do that same thing. I get that same endorphin release. I still get to help people, which I think is a is a big lesson in growing up, you know, like. The idea of what your your role is is not nearly as important as what your why is. Yeah, and you can keep your why and change your role. Agreed. And still see that same kind of connection to your passion. Um, but I hadn't had the opportunity to do it to the degree that I have in the last four months, and it's it's been good. You still have the connection with Hope? Oh yeah, love okay. it. I still go all there right. all the time. All right. Yeah, we go there every week. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. some of the, we're here with Joe Woolworth, owner of Relevant Media Solutions. You can go to relevantmediasolutions.com and check out uh, all the services he can help you with. If you or somebody you know is starting a business, trying to grow one, he will help you tell your story. I think you've learned that today. And, uh, behind the curtains, usually in a show before we get started, Joe comes in and I don't like to ask a lot of questions because I want to hear the answers on the air, just like everybody else does. So he and Amnon started geeking out about all the equipment in the studio here that Amnon has to produce this show and the other shows he does here at Nissan Communications and then the stuff Joe has built out in his house. And they lost me for a couple of minutes talking about sound boards and mixing and stuff like that. But you got to you got a hold of some pretty cool toys at Hope Community though, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we got to we got to work with some pretty industry standard but fantastic gear. And so I think when you have a budget for that, it's, it's really fun to be in a position where you get to, you get to use the products that you would really like to use uh, on a weekly basis. Cause we had a, we obviously at our campuses, we use iMag, which is short for image magnification. So there's camera systems that are all tied into a video switcher in the back and there's sound systems. And oh, you're drooling, aren't you? Yeah. Walking it's fun stuff. Here. I mean, I'm, uh, we didn't, we didn't use TriCaster. No, um, but, uh, Stop. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about the nerdy stuff. Uh, day, but let me tell you, this is what I don't think is nerdy, but I think is applicable. Like the idea of podcasting. Yeah. I think what's making it so popular right now, it's something that's been around for a long time. It's content marketing. Mm -hmm. It's a way to position yourself as a thought leader. It's a way to talk about what you know about and to allow people to build trust and empathy with your brand to hopefully want to do business with you at some point. And Back when I was running Marketing Jesus, the typical way to do this was to write blog posts to leverage it into a book. And I feel like what's going on with podcasting now is, especially with some of the major car manufacturers putting Apple and Google into the next version of cars that are coming out, this is people's preferred way of consuming this information nowadays. Agreed. They want to hear a conversation between some people. And, and I was joking with, Josh in one of our last episodes. I hope this isn't the reason because it's a pretty sad reason. But we've become so bad at having hour long conversations with people. It's like I just, I just want to listen to one, yeah, and just hear oh, yeah. the way people interact and it's engaging. And I feel like I'm there, and that's like a really sad reason. But I think we do want um, that kind of connection, that kind of relational connection. And I think that unlike the written word, uh, which still has a place, I'm not saying blogging is going away or anything. This seems to be a very relational shortcut for people. If you get to learn a lot about people's personalities if you get to tune into their podcast pretty regularly. Yeah, and, and I love it because it's on demand. Yeah. It's mobile. 
And I was walking this morning, listening to a podcast for that very reason. And it triggered something yeah. I'm doing down the road on a new talk I'm putting together. Yeah. But the same things is, is when I was growing up, we had three network channels. That was it. Yeah. So we had to wait. Mm-hmm. Oh, not till Thursday is our favorite show or, you know, Monday night football, but it's Wednesday night. So we had to wait. And now you don't have to. And if you Google podcast under any topic you want to hear about, a thousand will come up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm with you. I love it. And especially with like my boys are 30, 32 and 29. Yeah. I mean, that's their world. Right. And my grandson, Oliver, who I always try to bring into the show. And thanks for leading me into that. <laughs> That's all, it, you know, he's nine and a half months old. Yeah. That's what they're going to know. Yeah. Of that whole generation growing up. My kids fall asleep to a podcast every night. Really? Yeah. This, this great, I've listened to a couple with them. I mean, I haven't listened to as many as they have, but it's a storytelling podcast. It's basically two guys telling funny stories from their childhood. <laughs> and uh, they listen to that and they, and they fall asleep. Yeah. But, and you're talking about on the go, uh, there's obviously satellite radio, which is wonderful. You can get anything anywhere. My in-laws drove in from Texas. They were listening to the golf tournament yeah. while they're driving, which is neat. But podcast takes it something further because you can yeah. go, you know, I'll listen to that tomorrow. So and my, I'm with you. I love it. My hope for podcasting. And I, and I, cause this seems to be the way it always works. When a new media type comes out, there's mainstream because that's how it has to cross the hurdle to be a real mm-hmm. thing. So it has mainstream success and then everything kind of hyper, um, hyper geo, it comes about the city, uh, very geolocation. I'm thinking in okay. Google terms, like everything yeah. about Google's algorithm now is to drive people to near me. Right. Um, and so I'm really hoping we start to see that switch with podcasts because it would be really enjoyable to get to listen to people who are in your area, talk about things that are area centric. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, shows like ours and that's what we get to do we get to talk mm-hmm. to business owners who are from here and talk about like what the city's doing and and just because it's our neighborhood and it makes it more interesting it's like talking to your neighbors yeah and um, that's one of the reasons why mm-hmm. i wanted to do this show because there are so many hidden stories in this town yeah. you and i are barely a blip on the screen compared to uh landmark b- businesses and, right. and names of people stuff we've heard so but I'm with you on that. There's plenty of it's, stories. It's it's the the situation. Just like it was with radio stations years ago, it was all local mm-hmm. programming. Yeah. Suddenly, oh yeah, we can go and get it from all over, and people started losing interest because I don't. What do I care about yeah. this? What do I care about that? Now this is bringing it sort of like back because yeah. radio station lost that local stuff because they wanted to charge an arm and a leg, and here you can sit at home and do it. And people still yeah. can listen to you. Oh, yeah. It will. It it will happen. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm rooting for it. Yeah, I'm with you. And <laughs> let's dovetail a little bit more on that, taking it one step further into branding. So you have, um, you have guys who do stuff dot com. Mm-hmm. You have Joe Woolworth dot com. Right. And you have Relevant Media Solutions dot com. Mm-hmm. So for people out there that have a small business or are thinking about, okay, here's the next step I need. What's the reason and the process sure. for tying those all together? Well, if you're talking about like why I have three separate sites, it really depends on the audience you're going after. So if you wanted to build a a, a website that is a lead generator or a way that people find out about you, um, one of those three letter acronyms that people often use is SEO, search mm-hmm. engine optimization. It's the way that we as people who build websites understand the way that Google wants us to organize our information so that we can be found by their these little online search spiders. Yes. So it's it's a fun way to think about the internet gets crawled by what are these digital programs that are going to go to every website, look for key bits of information so they can organize it effectively. They want to know who it is. This is an email, et cetera. And so Google now says, thanks to this company or this thing called caffeine, that they're crawling the entire internet every 20 minutes, which is pretty fantastic wow. when you think about it. And um, so if you're going after a target audience, you really want to be focused on one of the elements that makes successful SEO, which is your keywords. And so if you're doing greatly different things, I would suggest you probably don't want one website with a bunch of greatly different things because it'll be harder for people to find you when they search for you. Gotcha. Um, But uh, so that's, that's a little bit of the difference in why I've decided to do multiple websites. And I have tons of websites that I, I've just bought because I thought they were good ideas and I'm going to build something there later. But it is all about (laughs) content and Google wants to know that you are refreshing your site with video or, or the written word on a, I don't know what their definition of a regular business is, but not once a month. Yeah. I mean, 
I'm just, I can just demythicize a little bit about what SEO is and isn't. There's a lot of really bad approach for marketing that comes from people in my specific seat. Well, they might run like a search on your website. You can use a free, free third party tool like Website Grader and they'll give you a grade on your website on things like your speed, your oh, okay. do you have a site map? Do you have the components that we know or we think we know are parts of the algorithm that makes a website easily to search? And so they'll use that as like, look, you're failing. And they'll put a postcard in the mail in hopes that they'll hire you to help make them not fail. Um, but what we do know for a fact is that that's the way Google makes money. They make money from selling us ads in their yes. search algorithm. And so they're not going to tell us the components that make up their search algorithm. But what they are going to tell us is what their mission statement is, which is to usefully organize the world's data. So from their mission statement standpoint, they're trying to serve up the best answers for the people using their search engine. So if you type in pest control, Google's job is to get them what they believe based on all the stuff that they know is the best pest control person for them to call. And so some of the parts that make up successful SEO are the keywords that you're using. Mm -hmm. What words are people searching for? Do you show up there? Your website's traffic is important. The amount of backlinks, quality backlinks to, and what they mean by that is other sites that have linked to you that like vouch yes. for you. So if oh, you're yeah. talking pest control, like are you rated good on Angie's list? Do yeah. you have a Facebook, mm -hmm. page, et cetera? Are you, uh, then they've got the Google business page, which is another component. Do you have a properly formatted Google business page? There's a lot of rules that we can follow. And this is the part that I feel like we don't do a good job as website professionals communicating. The best that we can do is properly follow what we now know is the best way to set up your SEO. The companies that are like, I can guarantee you number one SEO, they're, they're lying. They're, they're going to make it better than it was because they're yeah. trying. They're absolutely going to make it better than it was. We've seen those companies. But you yeah. can't. They, they, they don't lie. <laughs> they come up with keywords like Abracadabra 17. And they say, <laughs> search for it. Oh, yeah, I'm number one. But, but who's going to search for that? Yeah. yeah. So I think the challenge is like, if you're like me, and I think a lot of people are, you're just really taking it seriously now or you're kind of new to the, to the area. You would be better to spend your time focusing on having people find you. Like what makes you unique? And help make sure people understand that. Go to networking groups. Do the do the hard work. Because yep. um, I'm not going to compete with Centerline Digital downtown right now. Right. Like for a Google search on, a, I want somebody to build my website. And they're not actually going after the same clientele that I'm going after. But that's kind of how SEO works. We're kind of both going after web design and strategy. And so I think I like to use this analogy. It's kind of like businesses are like the girls on The Bachelor. And we're all just getting primped and ready to go. Okay. And we're just hoping that Google will pick us and give us that rose. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. But we really like don't it. know what Google's looking for. <laughs> and they're right. not going to tell us. In, in a lot <laughs> of things, when you go back to the keywords, if you can't think of the word handyman, you might type in, I need someone that can put sure. up drywall. Yeah. And Google would go. So that would. Absolutely. So if you're the handyman website, you need to make sure drywall and yeah. keywords like that. Everybody that. They, so they basically talk it into the search box. Oh, well, yeah. Well, if you hired a SEO firm, they would, they would do all the hard work on yep. the back end. And what they would do is they would build a page out that has the answers to common drywall questions and try to have a page on their website that relates to drywall. Mm -hmm. And they might have 800 pages on your website to try and pick up all those keywords. If this is something that's interesting to you, you can, Google has a free tool called Keyword Planner. So whatever it is that you're selling or your service that you're selling, you can go there and you can type in your address and what kind of range you're searching for. And they'll tell you how many people are searching for the word that you are going after. Right. Yep. And um, you might find out that it you know, suggested keywords there that 10,000 people might be searching for the word you're going after, but 100,000 people are searching for this word, which is an indicator that you should probably go up to that word. Uh, right. so, yeah. All right, let me stop here. So keyword planner. Mm -hmm. Keywordplanner.com or just type in keyword planner. You got to go to Google Analytics and they're always changing their name. Um, okay. But right now it's Google forward slash analytics is what I go to. And they okay. just actually renamed it again. I don't right. remember what the and the other. Okay. Two. Yeah. And then the other tip you gave us was the one for grading their website. Yeah. Uh, website grader. I Web, think. So website grader. Yeah. I'm trying okay. to remember who did that. I think that's HubSpot. Maybe. All right. Yeah. Citrix okay. is another good one. And some of them are super nerdy. And but those are things people can do if they have a website and either they built it themselves or somebody built it for them and then said, hey, I'm done here. I yeah. built that. They can at least check out and find out how good a job yeah. that went. And then they know they're going to call you at relevantmediasolutions.com. Sure. 
hey, this is where Just, I am. And I mean, I'm lost. like anything, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. A lot of the people that have the the graders are also selling you the services. Mm-hmm. So it's tough to really not imagine that they're not skewing it a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your, we talked earlier on this, your podcast, uh, guyswhodostuff.com. Let me get that right this time because I had it written down right but wrong on another place. I think uh, I've said it wrong on our show. Who's so, yeah. your, well, good. That makes me feel better. Uh, who's your, been your favorite guest so far on that show and why? I don't know. We've had a lot of – one of the things I've learned is that I mean, everybody has a really good story. Mm-hmm. Like I remember going into it thinking, like, I'm really going to like this one and then um, really ended up liking ones that I didn't know much about. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we've had a ton of interesting stories on the show. I got to interview Mike Lee, who's the founding pastor, that mega church pastor. That was a fun one for me. Uh, I consider him to be like a mentor. We got to interview a guy that had made like a thousand porno movies and had come out of that. And now he runs a CrossFit gym and actually studying to go into church. We got wow. to interview uh, Chad Price, who's the CEO of Vago Medical, fastest growing company in the triangle. Andy Andrews, who builds green skyscrapers. Mm-hmm. It was pretty fantastic. It's been a very humbling experience to me to see the caliber of people that are all coming in with a very similar thing is that they want to share what they've learned. Yeah. They really want to see other people succeed. They want to talk about like, this is what I've learned early on. Do this, don't do that kind of conversations. And um, yeah. And I live in the end of a cul-de-sac in Cary. And it's funny when it's Tuesday, my neighbors are like, what are all these people coming to your yeah. house? Cause they're like showing up in these really shiny, you know, Land Rovers and, and it's coming. And so who all comes over other than Josh and the guest? That's it. You, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. So Tuesday nights, you tape it. Tuesday mornings. Yeah. Tuesday mornings. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then it's up on your website by when? Uh, sometime on Tuesday. Okay. Sometime on Tuesday. <laughs> Go to guyswhodostuff.com. Yeah. Who's your guest? Who's guest for tomorrow? So tomorrow's episode will be Stephen Hand from BNR. Very nice. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the man himself. He's a friend of the show. Been on the mm-hmm. show. Uh, wonderful stories. Ask him how he met his wife. A uh, great story on a business he and his friend created to meet women. Oh, okay, so I, I asked him. It. We already yeah. recorded it. That okay, all right. Nice to know. Okay, <laughs> so those are fun stories. All right, so you can get Joe at uh, relevantmediasolutions.com. You can go visit him at his chapter RD02, Carry Connections, Mondays at 8.30 at the Maiden Inn. Goals for the second half of 2019 as far as growing the business. What are you looking to do or expand? Yeah, so for the rest of this year, my goal for this year is I wanted to be at 20 clients. Okay. And uh, one of the things that I like to do is not just be the typical, I don't want to pick on people, some website companies only um, design for their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so what happens for a lot of people, 42% of people, is that they won't hear from their website designer again, or they're hard to reach out to, or I reached out to them and they didn't call me back kind of stuff. Um, But the part that bums me out is the cycle seems to be that, um, 42% of people make zero meaningful improvements inside of a year to their website. And so the cycle that a lot of business owners get stuck in is paying for a new website every two years. So what what I do is I like to be a long-term partner. I want to see people grow over time. I built a lot of websites. And what I do know is that a strategy needs testing and it takes time to grow. I like to use the analogy that websites can kind of be like newborns at times. That for the first year, they might just be (laughs) crying and pooping. But eventually... Something changes, and now it's like, wow, this is yep. really good. And I think it's kind of like um, not having that partner to go with you through the strategy and refine and say, oh, people are falling out on this page, and this form isn't converting the yep. way we want. And so I like to come back and suggest meaningful suggestions once a quarter and, and make those suggestions, and I work off a retainer model. Because everything <laughs> changes. In your, in your general business model, even yeah. without the website, things change every quarter, yeah. every six months. And you have to apply the same principles to that too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think it's so great to work with a website professional. Like if you are thinking about using a website professional, I know one of the good question is like, is this your side hustle? Because mm-hmm. I used to, my pitch always used to be when I had another job, like you really don't want to use me. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to call you last. For some reason that pitch seemed to work. Like people are like, oh, he's so honest. And I'm like, no, I'm literally describing poor service that I will provide. If you, if you go with, you're so honest. Yeah. Um, but now I get the pleasure of if I learn a principle that's seemingly working good for a client, I can pass that yeah. down to every site that I'm doing. And so you really get the best of my current knowledge and everything is changing, like what you're saying. Yep. Joe, mm-hmm. we've enjoyed having you on the show today. Joe is owner of Relevant Media Solutions. Another reason to give him a call or go on his website. As he talked about earlier, there's many national ways you can go to build a website, but you've got to call a number if you want help. You probably have to put in a code, much like bigger banks, bigger insurance companies. Joe's local. He'll come out and help you. Again, he talks about the process and the plan. 
And if you're running or starting a small business, you better have processes in place and plans and he'll be able to help you with that. So check him out at relevantmediasolutions.com. Uh, we thank you for joining us today to hear about Joe and his company. And we'll see you next week on Triangle BNI. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.